Welcome to the Wednesday, July 17th, Queen Anne's County School Board meeting. Open session. Can we stand for the Make a motion to reopen session? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, we can. <laughs> it's open. All right. Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Let's try this again. Can we get open? Um, Reopen the open session. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Ready? Yep. Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 305, 3-305 and 3-104, Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Thank you. Okay, a motion to approve the agenda. To move. Second. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from the June 26th open session? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Board involvement. Who would like to speak? No. Well, shout out to uh, all the uh, coaches, volunteers that are uh, doing the conditioning workouts uh, for the past couple months at the uh, at the um, at the schools. Um, oh. Yep, and. Uh, I know they're doing a great job because I've been dropping my son off there and uh, he's stronger for it. And um, anyway, that's about it. I hope that everybody's enjoying their summer. Yes, yes. Um, so Queen Anne's County has been working with the Maryland Reads program and they've kicked off their session. There's a number of us from our um, school staff and myself helping out and trying to uh, work with this organization to think of really exciting ways to get our students outside of school interested in reading and helping out. So that's been a, a lot of fun. Plus attending the ESMIC conference that we had, um, it was actually really good. Beautiful venue. All right. What else? I'd just like to compliment Sid and his guys on the roof of yes. <laughs> Queen Anne's County High School. Yes. You got to tell those guys that are out there doing that. It's. It's a, it's a task in this kind of weather. We'll appreciate that. Thank you. That's right. All right. Dr. Salins. And I just wanted to give a shout out that summer school is up and running. Thank you to all of those that are involved. It takes many hands on deck from transportation to the CNI team, um, to all of your administrators and teachers in the schools making that happen. And so thank you. Um, lots of opportunities that are great for our students who need that, just that little extra. And so we're happy that we can provide that this summer. And again, kind of ditto what um, Mr. Schifanelli said. I hope everybody's really enjoying their summer and trying to stay out of that heat. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> to try to stay out of it. Yeah. It's everywhere. All right. Um, okay. Public comment? Um, we ask that all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board represent, respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. Annette DiMaggio. Good evening, superintendent and board members. Uh, my name is Annette DiMaggio. Um, I've been an advocate for uh, the Hispanic families in Northern Queen Anne's County going on about 12 years now. Um, it's now coming home because all those children are starting to graduate. Oh, just tells me how old I am. Um, so I've been invited to the graduation I attended this year. And um, I was a little disappointed in the fact that 
our families have no way that um, Spanish. We need to do something with Spanish. Uh, we had a lot of Hispanic parents sitting out in the audience that had no idea what was going on up on that stage. Um, I've given a picture to you um, of a young man, Lewis, who was in not too far ahead of me. That's why I snapped the picture. Lewis has, I've been working with Lewis's family for 12 years now. Um, just to be able to repeat what it says, completing what my parents couldn't, Alcunio, the dream. That is what that means in Spanish. And um, those parents, grandparents, siblings, a lot of them don't speak English. Um, some of them try, they just, they don't get it. Um, so, by the way, um, oh, I told you about the families. Um, I know how proud his family was, but after going out in the community and speaking to some of the families before I came here, um, that was the reason that um, I'm here. Because those families would like to be able to know what's going on up on that stage also. Now, I am not a tech suave person, so I had to go to my kids. And I told them what I wanted to do, and they basically, they gave me some ideas. And the ideas were uh, a jumbotron. I checked into that, look, can get a little expensive. But this was their idea. Now, I'm, I'm going to read what they say um, because, anyhow, uh, is the Board of Education meetings and events live streamed? If not, how long before they are posted on social media? Subtitles, assuming they are already have them in English, ask for them to be in Spanish. This can be accomplished through an outside service or some type of AI intervention. If going live stream, why not use Zoom or other services? Be sure to send out an email to those parents um, or to those families, especially our Hispanic population, and uh, that, that you're going to put something on the website. Um, I thought that that was the easiest way to do it because everybody wears iPod or the ear things, they could do it right on their phone while they were sitting there. I was sitting with families. I had to tell them when their children were coming up. So I guess my three minutes are up. So anyhow, I'm sure I'll be at graduation next year. I have a lot of kids that are gonna be graduating in the next few years. And um, so I just would like to see more done with the Hispanic community um, because their Hispanic community is growing more and more all the time. Thank so, you. Well, thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. you. That was it. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So next is HR report. May I get a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve uh, Human Resources and Substitute Bus Drivers Board as reviewed earlier. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Mr. Harding. All right. Good evening, Dr. Salins, President Bennett, and the Board of Education. Thank you for allowing me to come and present an opportunity for the students, uh, specifically the band and choir members of Canal High School. Um, they, as you know, they would like to attend an overnight field trip in uh, Orlando in the spring of 2025. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have regarding really any, any part of that. Um, our band director and course uh, director were unable to make it, but I've been kind of along for the ride with them, so I feel pretty able to answer any questions you may have. You need a board member to su help supervise? Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. yes, yes. Volunteer absolutely. Volunteer if you need that. Go along for the ride. You need to yeah. see right. to go along for the ride. Absolutely. Take Let multiple me know what you if you'd like. Yes, absolutely. All right. I, I know this is privately, are they funded, you know, doing a fundraiser for this and they pay for it? Yeah, actually a considerable amount to also yeah. include a very extensive um, payment plan that is varied and you know you can do anything from pay a hundred dollars a month to if need be there's scholarship opportunities so they're they're projecting I think it was 70 or 80 students to go and and we don't feel uh, that there'll be any issue as far as payment so I mean you, you find this this number which costs money to go somewhere absolutely it's yeah. obtainable and it's sustainable that they feel that they can accomplish this mission as far as funding 
guests, and I think it's also important to know that, and they've messaged this out uh, already. There was a, a letter or an email that went out on June 7th that just said, hey, this is still pending, but we want to get it on your radar so you can start planning. We won't start asking for money until late August, and even then it's a couple hundred dollars a month throughout the year. We'll get them to that number. Uh, and as I said earlier, if they can't reach that number, then they really simply need to ask uh, whether it's our music booster group or just the, the directors, what, what would you need to make this? Because we don't want anyone unable to go. But they also make it clear that really throughout the four years, and it's here, uh, they're calling it a large trip, a small trip, a medium trip, and a small trip. So if you're an incoming freshman, you know, and it may vary uh, how they do it, but right now we're planning this school year, a large trip, what they, what they claim to be multi-day and nights. And then next year, 25, 26, will be a one-day small trip. And then 26, 27 would be a medium two-day trip and then back to a small trip. And the thought there is every member of the music department will experience that variety. So it is not our intention to do an Orlando trip every year because we realize that's gonna get to be, you know, not cost effective, especially if there's multiple members in this within the same family so I, f I feel like they've done a fantastic job of of really kind of laying it all out there anything else I get a motion uh so just that the queen anne's county board of ed approve the overnight field trip to orlando florida from march 27th to the 30th of 2025 for the ken island high school band and choir to participate in the stars performance workshop no budget impact second all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Gass, for budget amendment. Good evening, President Bennett, Vice President Bent, Dr. Salings, members of the board. Um, I'm here to request a budget amendment for the 25 budget. Um, it's on page six of your budget book in front of you. Um, we have two federal grants that need to be adjusted. The one was for the Family Support Center. Initially, we weren't going to be able to sustain supporting the Family Support Center. However, we were able to obtain additional funding for that grant, so now we can continue to have the Family Support Center. Um, additionally, the second grant, we will no longer be receiving the Partnering for Youth grant um, because that will be go directly toward to the Boys and Girls Club and the EDGE, whoever secures it, because we will no longer be doing doing our after school activities there so so those are it has a net those are they're they're restricted funds so it's not affecting our operating budget at all we just needed to make those two minor updates <coughs> i'm assuming due to the nature of the grant it has to come through our system first <coughs> Wait, which one? Sorry. This grant that's coming to us to pay for this program, which is going to be administered. The Family Center. The Family Center one, yes. The one for PFY and the 21st century, that that you see zero there because that is going to go directly to them now. The Family Center is an increase, so the first part of that. The second piece, no, it will go directly to the edge and directly to the Boys and Girls Club. Now, and only because I'm just feel like I've been burnt a little bit with this one from last year with Chesapeake Charities. They're taking care of this PFY thing and all that, and it's their responsibility. I mean, we support it, we like it, it's a yeah. good program, but they're taking care of it. Correct. That's why it and I, will I, not be on our budget anymore. I can report, we just found out that the 21st Century Grant did come through. So okay. that happened last week, right? So. Congratulations. All right. Helen, any other questions? Well, I. Thank you, yeah, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, I just have a question. So initially, it said we had it was a three hundred sixty thousand dollar grant. Is that correct? Correct. That's what we received. Now it's four thirty five. Is that correct? Yes. So where is that net two eighty five? Well, that's um, initially we were going to have to go for zero dollars for our family center because we realized it wasn't sustainable at the three sixty amount based on the salaries that we have that we pay the individuals at the family center. We realized it was not sustainable at the three sixty. So we were going to go to zero for that grant. We weren't going to continue supporting. We weren't going to apply for the grant this year because we didn't have the money okay. to be able to sustain. Okay. So this grant in particular has several positions that are attached to it that you cannot adjust. Correct. And okay. with the increases in our contract, they fall under contract, so they get the same increase that anybody else gets per the contract. So it was going above what the, the grant, grant actually was going to give us. And we said, well, we can't sustain that. So Angela Gebert, 
wonderful, did an excellent job, went and said, hey, this is a position we're in. Can we get additional funding to sustain it for this great. following school year? Because of the late, it was late in the year. Mm -hmm. And um, they did, so they provided us with additional funding. So we are gonna be able to sustain that this year. We will not get those additional funds next year. Okay. And we will seek, they will, we will partner with them to seek another person to, they can partner with in the community to do it. Okay. So for this year, we will continue to be their partners, yes. but we will help them to transition to a new partner um, okay. within the community. Um, which they have done in many other districts because these grants are flat funded year after year after year after year. And when your salaries are going up and they're flat funded, you can't support them anymore. Yeah. Right. So, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I get a motion. Motion to have the board approve the budget amendment in the amount of $285,000. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, Mr. Combs. Got you a couple times. <laughs> Evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is Josh Combs. I'm the supervisor of technology. Um, here today for approval for two gin items for purchase approval. Um, What's the first one you need? Microsoft? Power School. Power School. Power School. Um, this is for uh, a little over 61000 This is for our Power School student information system. Um, that includes the maintenance support, um, backgrounds, or uh, backups, and uh, tier one support for that product. Um, this little background on the average, this goes up about 4K a year and it's been pretty steady for the past three years. So it has been very consistent in terms of what I've been seeing and the increase, at least for this product. <coughs> the sole purchase, there is, there, I can't, there isn't competitive bidding on this one. Any questions on this one? Can I get a motion? Uh -huh. Make a motion to approve the purchase of the Power School SIS, EMS, CMS, and M and S contract for one year, August 1st to the 2024 to July 31st, 2025. Fiscal impact $61,028.88. Budget source FY25, technology software, licensing budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, the second one is for our Microsoft district licensing. Um, this is everything from Microsoft Office to the servers, uh, desktops, uh, everything related to the Microsoft world. Here, uh, I did include our pricing, which is the meet far left, and then three other vendors that sell this product as well. So you can see the difference in pricing. Um, we went with the lowest, which is the, the meet contract. Um, uh, and that is for 79, 419, and 96 cents. Um, right now they've got, this hasn't went up, this only went up maybe $1,000 from last year. Um, they've been, we're still negotiating. We do try to do a five-year contract with them. This is us and the rest of all those school districts. We go in collaboratively. So they're extended our contract from last year. That's why we see such a small increase for, for this year. How long before we will know what the status is of the five-year contract? Make sure hopefully this got an extension. That's what they're working on this year. So we should know maybe by December, I'm thinking, we should okay. have a contract. And would it be a set increase each year? Or would it yes. Be a It'd be a hard set. So we know exactly what we can budget for the next five years. Any other questions? Recommend the approval of the MEEC Microsoft EES Agreement 2023 Microsoft Licensing to Bell Tech Logics Fiscal Impact $79,419.96 Budget Source FY 2025 Technology Software Licensing Budget Second All those in favor? Aye Aye Thank you <clears throat> All right, Ms. Passon that's a nice dress. I 
question for the Good evening, President Bennett, members of the board, Dr. Salins, and members of the executive team. Got it. For the record, my name is Bridget Passon. I hope everybody can hear me because I know the fans are loud. We're all trying to stay cool. Um, I have two agenda items for you tonight. Um, the first one is agenda item 5.06 regarding the purchase of teaching materials, digital licenses, and consumable textbooks for our reading interventions in grades three through 11 with the recalibration of how interventions are occurring, the loss of, of reading specialists, our teachers will now be running the interventions at different points throughout the day. So we are lucky enough now to have grant funding to buy those additional kits um, for the, the 30 plus classrooms we're gonna have running interventions. Um, so I'm requesting $66,873.56. Any questions? Oh. Motion for the, uh, to approve the purchase of teaching materials, digital licenses, and consumable textbooks for System 44 and Read 180. Fiscal impact $66,873.56. Budget source leads. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. The next agenda item 5.07 is in response to the board's request to offer more choice in our tier one instruction. And so teachers went and looked at data and we noticed we were missing a lot of protagonists that were not only male, but that were Hispanic and or biracial. So the teachers curated this list of books that have been out for public comment for the past 30 days. I have not received any public comment on the books. So we are requesting moving forward with the purchase of these books for each school. Um, for the student choice units to the tune of $18,340.80. What was that amount again? It's not on my yellow sheet. $18,340.80. It might be in the action part. Questions? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, First of all, I was looking at the six selections that the committee uh, chose, and I see three out of the six deal with immigration. Um, I think you mentioned that uh, most of them have a uh, significant impact in the story and that kind of thing. Um, why, why is immigration a prominent issue in three, three of the six novels? Well, it's a prominent issue nationally and in our community you know our students, I agree. Are, our students are affected by immigration um, their parents being undocumented and being sent back to their countries so why not offer it as a choice for students to look at and talk about in a controlled and safe space like a classroom to that end when i look at books like this i also think about you know sparking interest where are future immigration lawyers where are our future policy writers? If they can look at a book like this and see a story, albeit fiction, then maybe that will propel them towards making changes towards, no matter what side we're on, making the immigration system better and stronger. Yeah, and see, that's where I have the problem, because you're correct. It is a very prominent issue uh, on the national stage. We, there, we had two presidential candidates that were asking or uh, answering questions regarding immigration. It seems like somewhere around 50% of the country wants sort of an open border policy. Everybody's welcome here. It doesn't matter how you come in or if you're announced or undocumented or whatever. Um, and then there's half that uh, believe that the immigration laws that we have on the book should be enforced. You just can't, shouldn't be able to come in illegally um, and stay here. So it is a political issue. Uh, and that's what concerns me because I, when I look at the, the books, the synopsis and the, and the books that I took a look at, I, looked at reviews, um, the, I the issue with immigration that is presented in all these books is on one side of the political um, uh, aisle, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and it, it's very emotionally driven, uh, which is sort of an, another issue. Um, for example, in one of the stories, you know, the mother has been deported. Obviously, she was here in some illegal status, so I'm not sure if she came in illegally or without a visa or overstate or visa, whatever it was. And the boy's a high school student, um, and he's totally concerned about his mother having been deported. Now he's concerned about his father being deported because his father appears as a nervous day. Uh, he's a U.S. citizen. 
you know, he's got all these concerns and everything else. Uh, the other two books are, are sort of the same thing. So what's not, it's, it's really not balanced because on the other side, you've got uh, immigrants that are coming in illegally and doing a lot of damage. We had a woman in Montgomery County that was uh, murdered. She was a mother of five just recently. Uh, all the way back to Kate Steinle in 2016 and, and probably before that, there's been eight or ten that I'm aware of um, uh, murders in the past 18 months, two years, by illegal immigrants. And I'm not taking a side on either either side of the aisle. You know, I've, I've been an attorney for 20 years. Probably 70 percent of my practice has been in immigration. And uh, in fact, I've, I've probably got clients that are in this school system, parents, uh, and in the other neighboring school system. So I'm not taking one side or the other, but it seems like these books are, are presenting one side. And I don't think that's fair, uh, first of all, to parents who may be on the side that believe that immigration laws should be enforced. We shouldn't have an open border. Um, people who come in illegally, if they're in deportation and they don't have a defense, and I do defense of uh, deportation, that they should be deported according to the law. So, So you asked me why they were chosen. And I shared that, and you've used the word political several times. No ELA teacher nor English teacher will be taking any political side to this notion. For what it's worth, two of the books address the fact that the characters are there illegally, they are deported, and they're not brought back. And it explores that notion of immigration and how to get here correctly. So, so it is pretty balanced with two of the three having that there. Um, again, my interest is, to, is so that students can see themselves in books, to support teachers who want to teach these books, to bring some humanity to the issue and be able to talk about it in a okay. safe place, safe place at an age appropriate level. You're going I, to I, vote how I, you're going to vote. But, I appreciate, but I, you know, we disagree on this, Mr. Schoenlein. No, I, I know. I, I appreciate that. do so respectfully, but... You know, we, the, the public speaker are talking about, you know, meeting our Hispanic st students more and giving them more options and letting them see themselves. We've got a great opportunity here. And I appreciate arguing with, with you. We've done that before. You know, we have a history of that, and it's very constructive. Um, but that's another thing, too. It, I believe that the whole purpose was to increase readership and reading comprehension among boys. So, and you mentioned that the students see themselves. I got a problem with that, too, because... A lot of our students, I don't know how many, uh, have parents that are undocumented right. and are in danger of being deported. So they, I can only imagine, and I know for a fact, uh, with people that I've represented, they do talk about these things at the dinner table and in the house and in the family, and there are concerns. And my fear is, and I, and I see what is what you're trying to do, I, I get it, but my concern is a student comes to school who's Hispanic or any other uh, nationality, because it's not just Hispan Hispanics that are, are here undocumented and have immigration issues. But now they're in school, they're reading a secondary novel, and this whole worry and uh, this whole weight, again, is on their shoulders while they're here in school. Well, their choice, so they don't have to read them. It's an option. Sure. It's reviewed. The list has to go home. Parents have to approve it. Um, all of our teachers typically wait until the middle or near the end of their time with students to do the choice unit because they know the students very well by that point and can make recommendations accordingly. The students have a day with the books to, to look at them. Um, and going through this process, you know, I solicited calls um, from two of the from two Hispanic parents regarding it. And, and one of them wondered, you know, why do you have to tell the immigration story? My boys are here, they're American citizens, and they're regarded as, as immigrants simply because of the color of their skin. So, sure. so why do you have to, why this? You know, and I explained to her, my notion is to show that not all of our brown students are immigrants, but we do have them, and they do have an immigrant story, and, and it is okay to tell it. You know, in full disclosure, that's kind of what this process is for. There was one nonfiction text um, that teachers selected to review for 12th grade. Um, it's called Salido by Javier Zimenez. Um, and the parent and I approved the book, and the school-based staff didn't approve the book because they thought it might be too triggering because it was so real and because it was a real story. Sure. So it, it's, it's part of it. Again, I, I, you know, I am here obviously pro-reading and pro-choice and, and pro-topics and, and pro-providing safe spaces for, for students to, to talk about them. You know, we go through this because you have the final say. So, um, 
I just need to keep going. We could probably keep going all. Uh, I, I know, I know. But the public, you know, we're here in a public forum, and the public deserves yeah, to uh, have do. answers or to their concerns to the extent that we're they are concerned. Coming in our explanations on the MOI forms. As Certainly. Well. So, the the third issue that I really have is uh, a lot of the stories. You know, we're, we were trying to focus on boys. That was the whole uh, point of that September, October discussions that we had. <clears throat> um, stories for boys, whatever color. Um, like we've got this uh, Spider-Man uh, mm -hmm. story. Miles um, Morales. What's it, the last Miles Morales. Miles Morales. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a Marvel character. My kids are well acquainted with him and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but I've read the reviews. I've taken a look at the book. Um, there's There's... I mean, it's a lot of, there's no action. Let's put it that way. And the, the action, and we're off the immigration subject, but the only action in the book is apparently at the last section, you mentioned violence um, in your review, uh, the last 10 pages or whatever. Um, the villain is his history teacher. I, 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 does anybody see a problem with that? Um, well, the villain is a history teacher who's a racist. So, the, so th there is a problem with that. And so, so the, the story highlights fighting against the bad guys and the guys who don't treat students well, the guys who don't treat people well, because the history teacher has the same name as a bunch of other people out in the community. And they're all bad guys t treating people who don't look like them, treating them poorly. Right. So it, it's not about a kid after a history teacher. It, it's about a student after, it's about a right. boy so, but after it's, a it's bad a, guy. Right. But it, it's, it's a... It's a superhero, a Marvel, Marvel superhero, um, who's not battling some kind of super uh, villain. It's his history teacher who apparently is some kind of, re it really doesn't say what he is, but he, whether he's a reincarnated Confederate general or a slave owner or whatever, um, it's not your typical superhero book that I personally believe a boy would be interested in reading then that's the whole point was to get boys I give our boys choice because i think racism is something that a superhero would fight against and i think of course right a normal now, person would fight against racism and allies out there and there's people doing that work so in this contemporary setting and what our boys of any color are up against it is a relevant issue for them so why not give them the option to read it again it's his trials and tribulation in school and um and that kind of thing so but it's not his trials but, and tribulations at school it's his spidey sense gets activated when this teacher gets too close to him and then he starts <laughs> noticing all these things that are happening around him right and so again now it's it's another uh, uh for lack of a better word another progressive issue socioeconomic issues we got the race issue we've got immigration uh there's some other uh, categories that you well, rate. Real issues, and schools are microcosms of their society. So if we're not going to allow for our schools to be microcosms of our society, that, that, then you'll but vote against may, these. Well, my, we also have some uh, families that are well-adjusted, and the superhero is fighting a supervillain, and they're here legally, and it's just a, a boy book where they're out doing boy stuff because that's really what we wanted we wanted boys it wasn't really addressed to all of these other issues and so that it would be also a part of our society microcosm is that there are people who are here that are documented there are people here who are um fighting super villains in their in their superhero world and so i'm saying i guess i'm thinking there's both and we just keep it seems as if we're going down this path of always addressing other issues that aren't always there. Well, contemporary books are so, going to do that. So we were we were focused, focused on, the, on, on the now. Well, there's others that don't. They're so we just, can do freedom of choice or not. Well, it's another issue, and I've written about this before. Is that you know when you tell black students that, or when you when they're reading stories that every, there's a group of everybody out there, and they're against them, and they're going to have no chance in life. Of course, you got to fight against uh, unjust. Uh, behavior, unjust laws, all of that. I, I'm, there's no question. But when you keep pushing to uh, non-white students, I guess, black students and Hispanic students, that they're victims of racism. It's all around them. 
even though this kid's in a private pushing that and that's not in any of these books or any of this documentation that the committees did right well this history teacher is a racist this is a choice that the parent has to approve this right. is not a teacher teaching that everybody has to do it whether you want to or not or whether you agree or disagree this is just providing additional choices for our students that their parents get to make the decision of whether they feel that their child should have permission to read that book and not a board member not not a superintendent not a supervisor that says your child will or will not it gives the parent the right to parent their child and provide them with a choice we're just giving them opportunities but we're parents may the say parents, so, but, uh, but are we so we're now going to take the position that because we don't want them to have those stories, we're just not going to select those types of books? Well, I don't think we've we're gotten there yet. To... I think we're still discussing it. No, but that's not where we're, we're just discussing it. But I'm saying that we are kind of making the decisions for them because we're saying these are the books that you get to pick from. Right, but we're adding right. But, that. Right. And it's our right. responsibility. So these are additional proofs. books that yeah, are, are being added right. to ones that are already there. Yeah, but they are books. There are exactly. books that this that the exactly. school system is going to purchase, and, uh, and if the, just what are we here for? We're supposed to debate this and discuss it, well, present our ideas. I don't disagree with that. And but as say I said, yay or I nay. Allow the parent the opportunity to make the choice for the child. These are not the only books you, you picked out three or four or five or six or whatever you picked out. But there's a lot of other books that are there with lots of other opportunities yep. and lots of books that are already in our choice units yes. that do recognize some of the things that you've said. What we're saying is that we lack these books anywhere in our choice units. And so now we're bringing that hole, that gap that we don't have, we're bringing to the board to fill that gap <clears throat> so that parents can make those decisions for sure. their children. And so we're talking about English language arts and English instruction, English proficiency, but we're talking about very prominent, uh, very heated social issues in English class. So, uh, and I understand that, you know, literature, world literature, American literature, whatever, the best has some kind of uh, uh, psychological aspect to it, social aspect to it, that sort of thing. Uh, the death of Ilyan Ilyich, you know, uh, Ivan Ilyich, I'm sorry, by Dostoevsky, explored the psychology of death, you know, that kind of thing. P kids read it at college level, if not honors high school. But at some point, it's, it's uh, in English language class, we're not talking about exploring deep English literature. We're looking at current political issues. And my fear is that these kids, I mean, we're talking about eighth grade and they're reading um, about an immigrant family and all the hardship of being deported and everything else. That has an impact on young minds. And it may be an impact that is contrary to their parents' ideas that I explored at the beginning when I started speaking about this. They wouldn't choose that book. Pardon me? And they, they wouldn't choose, choose that, that book. book. Well, well we know a lot of parents, well, I just heard a public commentary. A lot of uh, parents can't even speak English. So I'm not you're right. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. But even those who do speak English, we know, and we're board members. We're here to uh, consider all these possibilities. Um, that you know, a teacher may kind of promote one book over the other. Let's read this or whatever. I'm not saying they do or whatever. But but on the same token, a lot of parents aren't really concerned either. So we're sort of the gatekeepers for all this stuff. And uh, you can laugh if you want. I'm not laughing. I'm. I, it's I, it's I'm, funny. I, it's, it's not it's, funny. It's not funny. I'm just saying that you suggested that our teachers would, would go and try to promote one book over the other. But it's a possibility. Like, Whether it's a probability, I'm not sure. But it is a possibility. It, anything is a possibility. Okay. It, you're, Great. So at this point, <laughs> in your way of thinking or in what you have said, then don't turn on the damn TV. Well, and you're you're what? talking apples and oranges. Oh, I am not. No, I'm talking about books, six books that we're contemplating buying. political climate and that these books are going to incite that for students that choose to read them. Well, incite what? Don't check Facebook. Don't turn on the TV. Don't do any of those things that are going to put you in a position to feel... Bad about Do we have TVs broadcasting on? in classrooms? No, these because are if you're going that way. I mean, parents have the right to do anything. The parents are in charge of the kids. Exactly. I that. So like when we looked at book, um, we had the bus 57 and, and it was told that we wanted to pick that one so that somebody would see themselves in it. I think it's really sad that the only book we could find where somebody was different is one where they get 
set on fire. Burned, right. Um, that was that's sad to me that we're not finding, I guess we're saying, or at least what I'm saying is, do we not just have something where there's a strong male protagonist that maybe it's not such a bad thing, that maybe we can leave some of these um, social issues. I mean, there's lots of issues in the world. Yeah, about 86 percent um, of our books have male protagonists that are that are from. These the, are just oh, additional percent. books. These are additional. You keep books. saying that we know. That they're we know. Books, over, and your parents 80, can buy them if they want to. Right. Over 80 percent of our texts have it. white male protagonists. That well, if are we doing, have 87 percent that are male protagonists, why did we think? But are there no black protagonists or Hispanic that aren't being deported or <laughs> victims of racism? Aren't there stories out there? Because the I'm hearing a, in a nutshell is there's no balance. But there's no balance, and there, I don't think there should be because we're talking political issues. If the point is to uh, discuss political, current political issues, social issues, everything else, is that really proper for English language arts class? Or is it to get them to read and, and that sort of thing? And some of those stories, I mean, I, if I was a boy, black, white protagonist, whatever, you know, somebody's going to live with their grandparents, I, I, I would be bored out of my mind if I was in that. that book. Great. No, I understand. Right. But you'd still have choice, so you could pick. But we're going to buy it. That's true. But we're going to pay for it. So anyway, back to Alexis' point. It's there shouldn't be a, a concern with balance. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. So there shouldn't be a there concern. Shouldn't, there should not be a. No, we shouldn't. We I, we shouldn't be purchasing books that that we we'll have to discuss what's balanced and what's not balanced, you know, and and the, we're going to discuss immigration issues with eighth graders, I guess. And, uh, you know, how is that discussion going to go and, and that sort of thing? Are they going to be maybe leaning toward one side? Um, it's just, it, it's a, it, they're, you mentioned it before, they're political issues. Um, I think they're best untouched. But for the characters and the trials that they're up against and of the course. trials are set in modern day issues that, right. that, that students... Well, there's, there's a lot of modern day issues out there that don't involve racism and deportation. Such as? Chances. And there are a lot that do. Right. Okay. And it is just providing that safe space. And I Let think it's important. Because we're, we're fighting against cell phones, too. And so kids don't want to read books written in the 20th century anymore. They want things that they can relate to. Kids their own age. Um, kid, kids that um, are going through something difficult and coming out of it okay, having learned something. You can go into any of our classrooms, 6th grade through, through 12th grade, and our English teachers are constantly fighting against the phone. Um, so why not make sure we're giving them options where they can really immerse themselves in a story that they're interested in, whether, and I correct myself, whether they see themselves in it as a window or as a mirror, or whether they see it as a window, something they could look out into the world and learn something about, or as a door where they can walk through and get a whole new experience. And, and that phraseology comes from Rumi Bishop, who's a renowned literacy expert. Mr. Smith had, I think. Sorry, Mr. Smith. No, that's no problem. Um, this is a, uh, an issue that people have different thoughts on and what, how you believe. And I guess it's up to the parents, and I agree with you 100%, it's a, it's a choice. The Material of Instruction Committee, who is on that committee? So a uh, teacher, a principal, um, a community member, a parent, one or two parents in most instances. We, we had a community, we had we had parents of current Queen Anne students on, on this the, committee on the that, that did these yes. books. Yes. Were any of them uh, males? Two, I think. Out of how many? Six. All right. So, I mean, do you feel, I mean, I know you're, you're coming from a certain way, and, and certainly Marshall, Arthur, and everybody, when they write something, write things in a certain way. And I, I get that. You know, you can read it or not. I do think there's an issue when you start putting in front of, it's our job when we put it in front of a child or a student, is it appropriate? And are we we're trying to stay neutral if you can? Right. In this world, you can't. Right. It's just, it's a tough thing. I only bring books forward that if a parent had an issue that I could defend um, from where I sit and on behalf of the and teachers. And these books have been out for how long? And nobody's looked, how many? 30 days. And how many's looked at them? Uh, nobody's, I, we, they were on the website with my so email. we have one review? Questions. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't know the answer to this because it, 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 there's, there's more underlying courage to this than just these books we have a CAC committee is that something appropriate to have it I mean I'm just trying to get and personally it, it, it uh, Chad and I read a thing people don't read like they used to no they don't I mean you know, the encyclopedia nobody goes and looks up something they google it on their damn phone you know so I think people seeing it and reading it 
and understanding stuff will help. Which way you're approaching it, it doesn't. I do buy in a little bit of the thing where I know our teachers are independent, don't push something. But when it, 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 it always should be put the wrong way. Here are some books. And the teacher says that, and all of a sudden you think you should read these books. I just hope we have a good enough thing of our community to make sure these are what we want. And I think having both sides of the story are good. We I followed just, the policy as it's written. I just, oh, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just asking this question because so many times we've had this thing go out. Who comments? Nobody comments on it. Who reviews it? Nobody reviews it. And then we only get the people that are really passionate on this side or that side, and that doesn't help. Which I think, you know, silence speaks volumes if, well, if nobody's coming out and getting well, heard about it. I think it speaks volumes in a lot of different ways. But Dick had a good point. I think the Citizens Advisory Committee, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a couple people on there who are experts in um, the gender gap. Um, including, the, and they were the ones that gave forth uh, the recommendations of how to address the gender gap using books that had male, you know, strong male protagonist um, characters. And that's all they said, just strong male, you know, so maybe that would be a good, uh, a good to see, to maybe throw it to the Citizens Advisory Committee. And that has us going backwards, and that requires revision of the MOI policy and adding in the CAC. We have the policy in place for right. this very reason, too. We have a committee in Make place sure that we reviews get the literature, and it does include teachers and parents and community. Is our policy? Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. we can change yeah. it. But we've got to approve the, yeah. the selections. I, I mean, we've got the ultimate. We're just trying to make but it. When, when, when you told me, and I don't even know who, but there there was an equal balance, and not, and not a lot like teachers and instructors and everybody. Don't get me wrong. but common person, the, the parents, do you feel strongly there's enough input from the community to feel that this is what they want? I do. So I'm, I'm, I really can't vote for this uh, motion, uh, omnibus as a whole, but just so we know, I don't, I don't know how the vote's going to go, but um, the City of Beasts by Isabel Linde. I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> Kids venturing out into South America to the Amazon. It's got cross-cultural value to it. That's fine. I going to love it, and I loved it, because I don't yeah. like magical realism, right. but I loved it. It was great. Should we vote one by one, or how should we well, do this? Well, hang on. Well, well, let me let me finish what I was saying, then we'll figure this out. But um, So I'm fine with that. that. That was Salvador Allende's daughter. Chile. Yep. Right, from Chile. And... Uh, and Marcus Vega doesn't speak Spanish. Uh, I'm fine with that. Although, again, I think it would be, if, if a boy were to pick it up, uh, I, if I picked it up, I probably wouldn't read it, but all the way through. When I was that age. It's hilarious. He's yeah, well, this big kid who protects all the other kids, and then he goes to Puerto Rico. It's a really sweet story. And I did read reviews and, and browse oh, what I could online. So on. that one I'm fine with. Um, I got no problem with that. So. Um, and I, I'm, unfortunately, I do have a problem with the other four. So, for reasons already put on the record. All right. So, what is the recommendation of the board for one by one? So we've we we've just, done this. Well we, can, well, we need to vote on this anyway. We've just, we've had this before. Um, with 57 bus, I think it was, or maybe not. It was it was oh, another it was the one. The other one, Six and we seven. voted by it one by one, and we've voted against one cover me yes um and so i i'm not sure how to proceed uh parliamentarily but if somebody makes a motion to well, i'll make a motion to approve uh two of the four books um specifically uh six books uh specifically city of beasts and uh marcus vega doesn't speak spanish if somebody wants to second that if it doesn't go anywhere we'll i'll second Any All those discussion? in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Three to five. You said aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Three to five. It was my Mark. I, I got Marcus Vegas speaks Spanish. I'm, I'm, I'm going to abstain on this because I, 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 my thought is I like Dick's idea. I know you said it's going backwards, but uh, if you said there was experts in gender gap and the whole point of this was to address the gender gap and then... I, I don't know. I like his idea of if there's experts on the. And I would recommend raise uh, reading proficiency. If that's the case, instead of 
instead of having a committee where we know who's on the committee and everything, and that's if all laid out. If we're not going to go by our policy, right. then we need to change well, that we're, policy. Well, I think we're going by the policy. It's just that, no, no, the, yeah, no the, policy, what the, poli the policy is that the committee approves the budget to buy these six they books? That they review books okay. and make recommendations to the board. And did they do that? Yes, they that's why she They made recommendations. They did. That's what so we have to, we are obligated to accept the recommendations? No, I'm saying she suggested that the CAC do the process, and I'm suggesting that that should well, not no, be our protocol. Well, no, we can address that at another time. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, okay. It should not be our protocol. No, no, no. The CAC do it right. have a policy. Right. And the no. board, it's the board's policy. If you want to break your policy, that's up to you. I, I'm sure the attorney would say he wouldn't recommend well, you break your policy. Well, we don't want to break it. We're saying that we can address this at another time but right now we had a motion and we had a second and we voted is that not what we did and so that should take care of it i heard and i apologize that's okay now. i heard marcus vegas speaks spanish he doesn't speak, speak spanish and city of beasts city of city of beasts. Beasts. Yes. beasts um in the plural Thank you. so uh, i guess where we go from here and we did i'm not sure what we did last time has been two and a half years or two years. Um, uh, you know, we, we, given everything that's been said tonight, I guess there's two people at least share some of what I said. Um, um, certainly more commentary is fine with me, even though the motion's been voted on. Um, obviously, we've got four more books that can be purchased. I, I just would like you to take a second look and, and consider what I said, you know, about these political issues, you know, multiculturalism and, and visiting foreign lands and having challenges and that kind of thing is great. It, it's excellent. Um, but to address, oh, policy. hang on a minute, Money's let me finish. You, you got your so hand on your mouth. So I can't. we redo the policy and get the yeah, CAC involved, we'll make sure more people write it, that passing. the money is going to be gone. That we so for these two out of six. Right. Out of six. Now six. we're kind of getting a little, we are okay. not saying we're redoing it. Well, that's, that's not what we're saying. That's something You're that we can voted address. against the other four, but we don't have the time. Okay, well, then that's it. Then it's over. Oh, okay. So we really don't have another opportunity. All right. And I mean, so, we voted for the two, and the you, extra money can go to fund balance, I guess. If it's not, no, like, no, it's a grant. Money. It gets back All right, it's grant so money. Then it goes back do to you, the state. That's right. I, I don't know the policy off the top of my head, but they, they recommended six books. Only two books were in the motion at all. Do they need to take action on the other four books because they were recommended? No, but they were, they were recommended, but they weren't approved by the board. I'm sorry, pardon? The superintendent, through the administration, makes a recommendation to the board for the adoption of curriculum guides, courses of study, instructional resources, things like that, which this falls in that category. And the board votes to accept, reject, modify, as you all have done, you know, those recommendations. So you can, you are good as is, if that is what you have chosen to do. Uh, the, if the recommendation to, is to adopt four more books and you're deciding not to do that, then that is your prerogative as the board under 4205. Okay. So, do they have to make a public vote listing all four titles against that they're those not, four titles? That they're not accepting? Yeah. No. And because I guess you have a recommendation that sort of dies on the vine. I guess my last question would be, so the committee and the work that they do really it, like their recommendation really doesn't mean anything no it's then. it's it absolutely it's the I'm work sorry. of yeah. getting to the recommendation okay. of getting to this point is through that procedure okay um that proceed the result of that procedure is what we've heard today right uh ultimately under 4205 the education article the the fruits of that procedure are the recommendation comes before the board for approval you all discussed that and approved two out of the gotcha. six. So that's yeah. what your decision is. Or that's what the board's decision is. I don't know what else to... All right. That's, that's all it is. You know, but I'll certainly put out there, these book titles are on the website. If a parent, you know, or wants to read it, they certainly can get it for their students. Um, if they... If they well, most of them in our, are in our libraries. So if... Uh, okay. They can go to the school library and get it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, Dr. Guido, how are you doing? Thanks for your patience. 
Good evening, President Bennett, <clears throat> Dr. Salins, members of the board and the executive team. My name is Darren Guido, supervisor of instruction in the areas of social studies, world languages, service learning, Title III, which is multilingual learners, and our um, migrant education program. Tonight, I come before you seeking approval to purchase English 3D. It's an English language development curriculum resource. We're going to use this in our six middle school and high school ELD classrooms. As I said last month, <clears throat> this is a resource as part of the HMH family. We already have some of the resources in other uh, venues. Uh, this is a mix of online and hard copy uh, resources, plus uh, five years of five years of the online, plus five years of the renewable books kids can write in each year. And this is going to be paid for through the uh, American Maryland Leeds Grant at a cost of eight. $118,598. Any questions? No. We had a motion. Recommend the purchase of the five-year digital license, student consumable, classroom books for HMH's English 3D for six ML classrooms in the middle and high schools. Fiscal impact, $118,598. Budget source, Maryland Leeds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kibler. Uh, good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team, uh, Dr. Matthew Kibler, assistant superintendent, uh, filling in tonight for Mr. Michael Page, supervisor of um, science, to bring before you action item uh, for uh, grades K to five, um, online and consumable materials for science for the 24-25 school year. We are hoping to use Leeds Amendment when we get that through. It is budgeted in the operating budget. So in the event the Leeds Amendment would not get approved, it is budgeted for in the operating budget. Okay. This would just relieve the operating budget. All right, any questions? Can I get a motion? Um, motion to approve the contract of the mm, Hockton Mifflin Hardcore. HMH. 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 We make it easier on ourselves. Thank HMH. you. We didn't when we wrote it out, though. <laughs> HMH Publishing Company to purchase a one year license for the Science Dimensions digital platform, interactive textbooks, and consumable textbooks for grades K through 5. Fiscal impact $153,835.69. Budget source leads grant pending amendment approval. Otherwise, FY25 operating budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, yes. All right. Miss Smith. Got you a few times, too. <laughs> I'll just pull it closer. There you go. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, board members, members of the executive team. My name is Jolene Smith. I am the supervisor of special education. Oh, sorry. I bring before you for um, approval, review approval and um, action, the staffing plan, the special education staffing plan for the 2024-2025 school year. So, um, the requirements to review and approve the staffing plan annually is part of Comar 13A 050213D and, and, and as such MSDE. Um, its purpose is to review all of the existing um, resources that are available to students with disabilities to ensure that those students are provided access to a free and appropriate public education. Uh, within their least restrictive environment. So this, the presentation this evening is pretty much a summary of the narrative version of the staffing plan that is presented in the yellow sheet submission that you have before you. So as you know, um, Queen Anne's County Public School is comprised of 14 schools. Our enrollment is around 700 or 7,500 students. Of those 7,500 students, 879 of those are students with disabilities, which makes up about 11.6% of our population. 
This is an increase from last year of about 20 students. Um, on the screen here, you see each of the 14 schools represented. And for each of the schools, you have captured their overall enrollment, as well as the students with disabilities and what is comprised of their census for that particular school. In the parentheses, in the percentage um, number that is reflected there, that is the percentage of the overall enrollment for each school. And then additionally, what I've done is captured kind of the increase and decrease um, for each of the schools compared to last year. So- That's um, a quick question about that. Bayside doesn't have that. Did they stay the same? It didn't have a plus or minus. It probably- Oh, yes, correct. So their, okay. um, their enrollment actually decreased by 11, but their special education percent or numbers stayed exactly the okay. same. Thanks. So for some of them, like for example, Mattapique Elementary, you'll see that the overall enrollment went up 27 <coughs> students, but their special education um, census went down by seven. Uh, some of that's gonna happen naturally with matriculation as we see larger cohorts go through the system. Um, we see years where we have more students that qualify for special education than, than other years. Um, as a whole, as I said, you can see that our numbers have continued to increase each year. Um, we are actually right there in line with the highest that we've ever been um, in Queen Anne's County. So we're, we're pretty, we're right at the top there. Um, each of the schools that have an orange box around them do have regional programs captured within the school, at least one, some of them more than one, and that will impact the overall percentage that's reflected there. So for example, Queen Anne's County High School has three regional pro programs reflected by three RP. And so you can see that their 10% is, is capturing those regional programs where students from other you know, schools may be coming there simply for that regional program. So um, Queen Anne's County Public School provides special education services for children and students birth through age 21. We do so by providing a service delivery continuum and for those of you that have sat here, you've seen this slide before, um, but for anyone new, I think it's important to capture and explain that we do provide services um, across the board from inclusion settings all the way through to our regional um, self-contained settings. In some instances, we are forced to consider more restrictive options through things like the non-public or residential facility, but we do everything we can to avoid that to ensure that our students are accessing their least restrictive environment. It kind of looks like this would be a sliding scale and that students would fit in one place or another on that scale, but actually truth be told, because we are so inclusive, many students may access one environment and then come out and access another at a different point during the day so that we can maximize their opportunities to interact with their peers. Uh, here in Queen Anne's, we offer related services such as speech language pathology, transportation, um, and we also partner with the Midshore Special Education Consortium to provide services such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, audiological services, teacher for the visual, visually impaired, as well as the hearing impaired. So on page 11 in the narrative version of the staffing plan, you can see a more robust description of that continuum of services. And you, this can also be found on the Queen Anne's County um, Public Schools website. So just to give a little bit more information about um, our population and who we serve. So as I mentioned, we start with some of our students at, at birth and um, they are provided services through our infant and toddler program. This past year, we served 158 children, which is an increase from around 111 last year. So that's a lot of, of little friends um, that we've been had the opportunity to work with. But that's great because that means that if we can catch them early on, perhaps we can give them the interventions they need and then they will no longer qualify for special education services down the line. You can see that um, most of the students or children that we served were between the ages of two and three. So even though we did have more, more children, we are still capturing them at two and three as opposed to birth and one. 
so at the age of three, those student children that qualify um, have the option with their families to continue through the infants and toddlers program on an extended individualized family service plan or an IFSP or they also may choose to go over to the school age services on an individualized education program or an IEP. So we have a um, preschool program for four year olds and three year olds this past year. And that is a highly, it's a language rich environment where our students with disabilities are working side by side with their peer models to really be exposed to a lot of those early learning school readiness skills and behaviors. Um, you can see that still 50% of our, our children in this age range between three and five chose to participate in the itinerant services. And with the expansion of the um, full day pre-K model, next year we will be discontinuing the regional four-year-old programs so that they have the opportunity to participate full day with their um, peer models in the general education setting. And we will expand our three-year-old program to offer the opportunity for our North County um, children at Churchill Elementary School. This is um, another representation of the information that was shown on the slide with all the schools. Uh, it's just kind of depicted a little bit differently. So this is a slide capturing our school age population. You can see the total school enrollment um, reflected on the top and then the students with disabilities on the bottom. The reason I show this is because it's very important to keep in mind that all of our students with disabilities are general education students first. So they're captured in the top line and the bottom line, whereas our bottom line students are not, um, we're not capturing the general education students there. Here we have a historical view of census by disability. So students that qualify for special education are identified under disability codes as determined by the IEP team. You'll see that we have consistently had students with a specific learning disability kind of at the top in terms of the number of students in that category, followed closely by other health impairment and then speech language um, impairment. What's kind of nice to see is that we're seeing a slight decline in our category for specific learning disability, which is coupled by a slight increase in other health impairment. Um, but comparatively speaking, overall, um, it, it remains consistent. These are always gonna be kind of our top categories. Um, and that'll be important in a couple slides. Um, the reason I'm happy to see that SLD come down a little bit. So this is a slide that we're really proud of. Um, here in Queen Anne's County, we're a very highly inclusive county. We regularly, um, or actually consistently, exceed the state target for inclusivity in terms of our students participating inside the general education setting 80% of the day or more. We anticipate our percentage to be 82.7% in October, and that is a slight increase from last year. Always, always good to see. But it, I think it's important to note that obviously there has been a decline over the years in terms of our, our participation in that inclusive setting. But I think that that is largely attributed to um, we have an increase in our needs um, and we have been really responsive to that by providing additional opportunities along that continuum for more pullout services. I really applaud um, our staff for really champ being champions for inclu inclusion um, and providing them opportunities to interact in that general education setting, even our students with mo our most complex needs. So just some highlights from this past year that relate to our staffing plan. So we were able to um, decrease our areas identified as being disproportionate this past year. So we went from being disproportionate in two areas to being disproportionate in only one. And that one does continue to be a specific learning disability. But like I said, we did see a decrease there. So that's good, we're making progress. And I attribute a lot of that progress to um, really our focus on kind of developing those high quality effective IEPs really kind of bringing our focus back to MTSS and and enhancing the pr practices associated with that and then really kind of 
spending more time on our identification practices. And I have to um, kind of applaud our school psychologists for their work in that role because they actually kind of took it upon themselves to um, create professional development for our staff so that we were being more consistent in our identification practices. The second um, area that I, I like to celebrate is that we were able to exceed the state targets in reading and math for elementary and middle school levels um, in terms of our proficiency rate for children with IEPs against grade level standards. And again, I really, I can't, I won't personally take credit for this. I have to give it to the special educators and the IEP chairs. I think that their, their focus on compliance, their, especially at the secondary level, even our general educators have really focused on co-teaching and elevating their level of co-teaching um, so that they can enhance instruction for all of our students, including our students with disabilities. And that's really kind of raising the bar and making sure that we're holding those high expectations for all of our students. Um, we do seek public input and I personally, as well as other members of my team, um, we talk with administrators and staff about their needs. We talk to different community organizations. We meet regularly with the CCAC or the Special Education Citizens Advisory Council. Uh, and we review schedules to really get a handle on what is needed in terms of staffing. Additional information about that can be found on page two and appendix A. Um, and then again, also, we definitely rely on our special education parent support, such as our family support liaisons and our chair of the CCAC. It is a requirement in order to secure federal funding that we are able to demonstrate maintenance of effort. And I am happy to say that Queen Anne's County is able to demonstrate that maintenance of effort as demonstrated on um, the historical slide before you. So finally, when we look at those um, staffing patterns, it's very important for us to consider lots of different factors. Some of those include caseloads. Um, it can include kind of the the service delivery models that are being deployed, and it can, and we also need to look at frequency, duration, and the dosage of that, so that we make sure that we're meeting the needs of the students. Um, so we do all of that and analyze that information in order to figure out what that deployment needs to look like. Additional information related to that can be found on page four and also in Appendix D, but to summarize that for you, here you can see a copy of kind of the summary of the staffing structure, which is detailed more in the narrative version. And just to kind of summarize that a little bit farther even, um, here you can see the allocations for the 24-25 school year. So based on local funding of the approved budget as well as grant funding that we have secured um, from MSTE, which is state and local or federal funding, we are um, requesting 48 special educators, 10 IEP chairpersons, 11 PACS teachers, three pre preschool special educators, three PEEL special educators, and two ACE special educators. It's important to note that this is not a change from last year. This is a consistent um, reflection, even though we did have a slight increase in our census over um, from last year to this year. So we're not asking for anything additional. And we are still able to keep our caseload average where it was. Last slide, I promise. Um, so finally, we have our related services. And these do include um, our personnel, such as speech language pathologists, school psychologists, um, as well as our MSEC partners. You'll see that the local and grant funding is reflected here just to kind of illustrate how, that, how those positions are supported. And you'll also notice that our speech language um, pathologists carry the largest number of contracts, which will be important in a minute. Um, and I think it's also commensurate with the fact that when I was talking about those numbers in terms of um, students and where they qualify, keep in mind that the third highest category was speech language impairment. Um, so it, it is reflective, reflected in that contracted service line as well. Are there any questions? 
Mine quick. was way longer than, than Dr. Guido's is going to be, so you have that to look Just a quick to. one about the Horizon Pass. So we didn't have, a, and now we're able to provide, we didn't have a special education teacher dedicated to a Horizon Pass before. It was all just shaded out except for this coming year. So did we get, were we able to have one now for them or? No, we've always had an Horizon okay, teacher. It was, okay, I must have misread the slide it seemed like it was shaded out except for this year oh so. that's just because the numbers fluctuate so that's okay. the census for that particular school or the enrollment okay. and the numbers fluctuate throughout the year so i can't capture right. a number thank o you off to the right of the chart it says one teacher it's just the numbers of kids in the program aren't there yet okay thank you thanks mm -hmm. any other questions all right can i get a motion motion to approve the <clears throat> fy 25 special education staffing plan which will be submitted to msde second all those in favor aye, aye. all right next okay so next i bring before you 5.11 uh, which is a contract for speech services through chesapeake speech this is a sole source um, because speech pathologists are very difficult to find these days um, so this is for it's actually it's one speech pathologist that covers four days of service at two schools, and then another speech pathologist that is covering half of our infant and toddler caseload. So she does three days a week. Um, and it is in the amount of $156,840. Any questions? <laughs> Number wise, how much is that percentage wise from last year? Uh, I don't have the exact percentage. I, I know our I know our costs for employees have gone up drastically, both with health care and <laughs> everything else. So when we contract somebody, I'm assuming is that going up the same rate pretty much? Actually, it's in these on for these contracts, it's less. Less. Mm -hmm. If we these are not large agency contracts, these are local um agents or groups or individuals that are contracting with us for services so it's a different price point they don't have as much of an impact in terms of all of the overhead that some of our large agencies carry um but they also don't have we don't provide health insurance and that's a huge lift for us for employees right that's that's what i'm saying you know the cost of we have to maintain an employee when we get somebody like this seems and it's not up that drastically it's i mean you can't do that everywhere but it certainly doesn't hurt here yes we're we're extremely lucky in these cases um with with these entities and i want to hold on to them as long as i can <laughs> any other questions can i get a motion motion to approve the contract with chesapeake speech fiscal impact 156 $156,840 budget source, FY25 restricted and unrestricted operating budget. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So um, item 5.12 is for a contract for occupational therapy services. And this is for the Williams Organization LLC in the amount of $99,750. This is one person um, who covers six schools and she provides occupational therapy services five days a week um, to our students in those lower county uh, schools. Any questions? One person. It's a lot of work. They probably do, was it twice, once or twice a week they would meet with a student? It depends on the IEP. Some it's monthly, some it's weekly, some it's bi-weekly. It, it all depends on the student and their level of need. Okay. Any other questions? Can I get a motion? Recommend approving the contract with Williams Organization LLC. Fiscal impact $99,750 budget source. FY25 restricted and unrestricted operating funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And then finally, I bring before you 5.13, which is a contract for eBear SLP LLC for speech therapy services. 
This is for a total of up to three days for one school um, in the amount of $78,000 uh, from the unrestricted operating budget. How many students? Um, More than five? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think I want to say anywhere between 50 and 60. Okay. And we meet all their needs with the, I know it says not to exceed 78,000. So we've not ever had to where we've met all their students needs with within the contract price. If I think I heard you correctly, Sorry. Um, can you repeat it? Yeah. So we, it says not to exceed the 78,000. So since that's up to, have we, we, I assume we're meeting all the students needs in that amount, that contracted amount that we're able to take care of them. Absolutely. Them. And there are instances where so again, I can't predict exactly what those numbers are going to be because sometimes students are exited and they no longer need those services. In the event at the end of the year that there is funding available, we close out that purchase order and it goes back into the fund balance. In this case, just because it's unrestricted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I get a motion. Motion to approve the contract with eBear SLP LLC. Fiscal impact $78,000, budget source FY25, unrestricted operating budget. And second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have so a much. good evening. You, you too. too. Thank you. So this is a time for break. Do we want to press on? Press on. All right. Then we, oh, Mr. Guido, he was taking, he was taking chances. He was Guido. sitting up front Dr. Row. Guido. Pardon? Guido. Dr. I'm Guido. so sorry. That's okay. Dr. That's all right. Just help it out. Yep, thank you. Oh, my <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, got, <laughs> I got a lot of jobs here. <laughs> here you go. Lots of hats. Good evening, President Bennett, Dr. Salins, members of the board and the executive team. Again, my name is Darren Guido, Supervisor of Instruction, Social Studies, World Languages, Service Learning, my, uh, Multilingual Learners, and Migrant Education. I'm going to get that all the way through at one point. Guido, can I just add one comment before you start? Sure. Just for clarification purposes. The reason that Jolene's was on an action item is because it's by law that we, the board, approved that. This is an informational item. We don't have to provide this information, but we think it's very valuable information for the board. So that's why sure. one is an action item and one is not. Thank you, Thank Dr. Guido. Yeah. So tonight, I just come before you to share information about the staffing plan for next school year for our multilingual learner teachers. Uh, we are required to uh, provide supplemental English language instruction to any student who does not, whose first language is not English. So that's why um, we have our ML program. This is a breakdown of the English learners over the last six or seven years. And I show this to you to show you the continual growth that we have. I don't know what happened in 20 and 21, why there was no growth whatsoever. That, that from 20 to 21, COVID. It's COVID. COVID. Right, right, right. But still, it's the exact same number. That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, usually, those numbers change, whether it goes up or down, yeah. the fact is the same. I think just same. COVID, I think the data collection because of COVID was okay. probably very challenging. Okay. So, I mean, I, I think I would, you know, contribute it to that factor. Okay. It continues so, to go up. Mm -hmm. The high point of our enrollment was 447 multilingual learners last year, which was an increase of 54 students from the previous year. We ended the year with 409, which means that 38 of our students met the criteria from K to 12. It was a mix. They met the criteria to exit uh, English language services. All students who enroll, they get a home language survey, and we are required to screen anybody for ESL services or multilingual services. If their parents respond with a language other than English in one of three, uh, one of three questions on the home language survey. What language did the student first learn to speak? What languages does the student most often use to communicate? Or, and, what languages are spoken in your house? So that, that's the criteria for us to identify, to screen students, and then if they don't meet a certain criteria, then we are required to provide 
uh, EL services. This is our projected enrollment. And the way I created this projected enrollment was I moved every kindergartner into first grade and I put them in the right school. And I moved every fourth grader into fifth grade and put them in the right school. You'll notice the kindergarten has an asterisk by it because those are all of our pre-K students. We don't identify any multilingual learner in pre-K because they're, they're learning language anyway. So we don't screen students until they start in kindergarten. So if every student <coughs> remains in the school that they are projected to go into, that's what we will have. And if every one of our pre-K students who on their initial uh, enrollment show that we would screen the students, that's who we have. These are phantom numbers because we're gonna have kids moving in and out, but this is what we have to build our um, uh, projections off of. And so the number of teachers in the schools hasn't changed at all because the, the, the students are living in the same geographic areas. So we're still gonna have the breakdown as we are. We have one teacher, that half teacher, she actually spends part of her time, the half teacher at, um, at Churchill spends part of her week at Suttersville Elementary School as well. So she's cre we've created a great schedule for her. She's able to um, get to both of those schools and service the students uh, really well. Are there any questions? I know Spanish is our big language mm -hmm. for that. Do we have any other ones we're teaching or? Great question. Let me get that information for you. I have it, I, I pulled it up because I thought that would be. I mean, some counties, I think of like Montgomery County and around those areas probably have multi, but I mean, I'm So sure. we have 15 languages spoken in our schools. 15. 15. A majority is Spanish. English is the second language. So we identify the student's home language by the language they first spoke. So that first question. So whatever that first question is, that's what we identify the student as their home language. But there are two other questions on the home language survey that would kick us into having to, to screen the students for EL services. So maybe their parents speak a, another language, but the student was reported to have spoken English first. We still provide those opportunities for the student to grow in that area. So we also have students who speak Chinese, Turkish, Russian, Vietnamese, Amharic, Swedish, Gujarati, Punjabi, Arabic, and Portuguese. Okay. And it's a significant drop off when we get to Chinese and more specifically Amharic and below, it's one student. So there are, or it's a family. So a brother, sister speak Vietnamese. So those are the, the languages we have. And that's just in our small county. Just in our small county. Yep. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Guida. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guida. Very helpful. <laughs> Next is Dr. Salins with the cursive writing update. Yes. Yeah, so um, President Bennett specifically asked for an update on cursive writing um, to be on the agenda. Um, so the purpose really is to just simply update the board as it relates to the cursive writing implementation. Now, granted, that implementation officially didn't have to begin until next school year, but we were very um, uh, responsive to the request and um, immediately looked into the curriculum um, to determine where in our curriculum would it best fit, where was it maybe already in the curriculum, how could we you know, modify what we were curr currently doing, and so we did that. So you'll see on um, slide three, that the writing standards one through three include the legible handwriting and that the correct formation of cursive letters. And so you'll see in our new HMA, HMH, and your new HMH, which is interreading curriculum, that that's already was embedded in there. And so we simply monopolized on that opportunity to immediately start doing that. So you'll see that instructional cursive handwriting is provided four out of five days each week during whole group instruction, approximately 10 minutes of that instructional time, the cursive writing is um, just really already a part of that second grade curriculum. So that was fantastic. 
moving on to the next slide in grades three through five, we're really at this point reinforcing what has already been taught through their whole second grade year. And so, um, you know, during that standards one through three, applying, since they've already learned it in second grade, applying the opportunity to practice that um, neatly and legibly. And so during their May due time, um, they can develop those um, skills further. Um, students who haven't mastered that skill can, you know, work on block writing, and you're gonna see some pictures here in a minute. Um, and again, during that May do in the form of centers, so in third, fourth, and fifth grade, students, why, why the teacher may be working in a small group setting with some students, other students have time to go to centers. And so this has been incorporated into those centers, and um, we do have a minimum at least two times a week that the students have to engage in that particular center. So um, I think we, the teachers did a fantastic job. Kudos to um, Mrs. Giebert, Angela Giebert, for her um, swift you know, um, <coughs> action and meeting with teachers and letting them know expectations. Um, so you'll see as we move through the different pictures of students actually um, learning and practicing their cursive writing and next year we'll be out of the gate um, with it as a you know, full-time um, part of the curriculum as requested by the board. Thank you. Thanks too for that. I mean, I guess speak for I speak for myself. I mean, maybe the whole board though. How grateful we are that you did that. Absolutely. I, mean, that I like that last picture. I know. Yeah. Right. It's the like, pictures were oh, priceless. Oh my! I just. That's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the struggle work. is real. Is that what they say? <laughs> yes. No. I see. I I see that as focus. Sure, okay. there you go. Yeah. He's working hard Making on Making sure it. he's focused. He's working not hard Not distracted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sure. that. Sure, absolutely. All right, um, Ms. Gast, for expenditure status reports. Best for last. No. Mm -hmm. Hello again, members of the board, um, President Bennett, Dr. Sailing. Dr. Sailing, um, executive team, once again, I... I'm Whitney Gass. I'm here to present the expenditures for 24. So back to current year. I know we've been focusing on budget for 25. Um, we are tr still tracking about the same overage we expect. We will use all of our fund balance of 2.129. Um, we were current as this report was ran on 7.8. We were at we were negative 2.98. I just double checked right now. We're currently at 3.404. So the slight delay is working through all of our invoices for June that we're still receiving. We expect to wrap up paying our invoices by the end of this week and then working on closing our books in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Any questions? Just that we've spent a lot of time on budget over the last year and asked many of questions. No use to ask them again. I just hope at our next meeting on the 30th, mm. we will have final numbers so the board can react in an appropriate way. Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is our public comment again. Is there anyone signed up? No, ma'am, there's up? not. Okay. So our next meeting, we have added one to our agenda, which is gonna be on Tuesday, Tuesday, the 30th of July at 5 p.m. And then we'll- Just wanna clarify that it's a work session. It's a work it's session, yes. A it's a work session, yes. No public comment at that point. That's all right. And then there will be August 7th our, at 6 p.m. is our regularly scheduled um, open board meeting. All right. Any questions or comments before we get a motion to adjourn? I get a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.